Thank you very much for, the, for, for, for that invitation. And, and this is, does seem like a timely point to be thinking about how we do strengthen the possibilities for generating some meaningful in, in evidence about what public health interventions do, what sorts of health they foster, what they don't, and in what circumstances. And I guess increasingly our evaluation teams do consist of collaborators from across different disciplines, and we're often generating very different kinds of data sets. And what I want to do today is just kind of focus on, um, I guess, first of all, one particular scenario where we're evaluating the primary qualitative data and often some quantitative data um, uh, using some sort of statistical analysis. And then briefly flag qualitative comparative analysis approaches as one way of integrating data. And then maybe just reflect a little bit on um, some of the things that I think help in a project to generate a bit more integration of those data sets, um, just from my own experience. So the context, I guess, is that, um, like most people, I've been involved in a number of um, public health evaluations that do generate a mix of data, both for health service evaluations and more recently for public uh, interventions that are uh, impacting in some way on the public health. And largely what's happened is that those two sets of um, uh, research happen in parallel. I'm leading on a qualitative component, somebody else is leading on a more epidemiological component, and we kind of do it side by side and we write it up in separate journals. Um, the final big report for NIHR or whatever has the different chapters with those different um, different sorts of data in them, and we end up not really integrating them. But I do wonder sometimes whether we're just missing, uh, and sometimes that's fine, that they're answering different kinds of questions, we learn from each other as we go along, and perhaps they, they don't need to fit together too well. But I do wonder whether we're sometimes missing a bit of an opportunity to do rather more, um, particularly in the light of increasing interest in comp what we might call complex causation. And of course, uh, almost all of the, the things that we're looking at in public health, if we're looking upstream, are complex. We're trying to understand not just what happens narrowly when one thing affects another, but we're trying to understand what happens to a system when something changes in it and what the multiple effects um, across different kinds of health outcomes might be. And this is where I think some sort of better, better ways of integrating the different sorts, could we just go back a slide or two, um, the different sorts of um, uh, um, data that we're integrating might generate. Now, an underlying challenge, I guess, for doing that is that, that the sort of logics of causal inference might differ across the sorts of data and the sorts of disciplines that we're working in. And if I can, I, you'll probably be relieved to know I'm not gonna go into the philosophy of causation here, but just in a, a kind of way. Typically, the more quantitative analyses from trials or even natural experiments, which are built on the same kinds of logic, the, um, the causal inferences are largely deductive, they're probabilistic, they're based on things like the difference between the case and the counterfactual probabilistically. Whereas qualitative analysis typically derives from some kind of analytic induction, whereby arguments are built up through a series of comparisons of the commonalities across cases, and then sort of testing those logically, e.g. through hypotheses testing or through looking for deviant cases, to start putting together a, a kind of logical argument um, from those kinds of comparisons of what's similar and what's different. So I guess rather more deterministic causal accounts. And Nancy Cartwright um, has written a number of things uh, on critiques of RCTs and um, uh, um, the philosophy of, of methodology. And, and one thing she says is where, whereas trials are clinches, if you've got evidence from a trial, it kind of clinches the causal um, uh, the evidence for the causal inference. But of course, the critique is that they are not only very narrow, but that clinching only holds when we're absolutely sure the assumptions we've got in the trial are, are sound. 
Whereas, of course, those other more inductive sorts of analysis are typically vouchers. They can only vouch for this causing this in this particular system. So um, if we just move on to the next slide. And again, I'm going to steal this example um, shamelessly from Nancy Cartwright because I saw her use it in a seminar once and I thought it was, it was um, a good way of thinking about these different kinds of causal inference. And she takes this kind of Heath Robinson type diagram where um, you've got some humorously convoluted system of um, cause and effect and you know, so where you've got a, a man tripping over or, or something hitting a man at one end of the chain and that trips something which pulls a lever, which sets some steam off, which sets a, a pulley going all the way to the other where a knife is being sharpened or something is being cut. So she kind of uses the analogy where a trial is perhaps overly concentrated in terms of the logical inferences on the top level, the, the the complex chain where the lever pulls, the, the pulley, pulley turns, the, the, the something chops. Whereas what it doesn't do is perhaps have quite enough focus on what the underlying causal mechanisms are that make pulleys pull or balls roll or gravity work. Now, that might not matter because if you've got something like a drug trial, you've got, of course got a wealth of theoretical evidence from um, about the underlying structures, about from laboratory science, from all kinds of other um, basic science about the kind of mechanisms that might generate the ways in which aspirin might reduce the pain of a headache. You've, you've already got that kind of quite detailed theoretical knowledge often. But of course, in many of the areas that we're looking at for public health evaluation, we're a bit we're a bit thin on the ground on some of that theory. For some of the topics, we just don't know it. If we're thinking about topics like uh, the impact of pollution on human health, some of that science is relatively underdeveloped, at least there are bits of it known, but when we put it together to look at how different species of pollution interact or what social process, what pro economic processes generate more or less pollution and what happens, we're a bit thinner on the ground. We're also argu arguably a lot less good at pulling in the kinds of theoretical evidence that are available. And they might come, that might come from sociology, from economics, from psychology, from a whole field of disciplines that we need to pull in in order to understand those underlying causal mechanisms that link something like mobility practices and health outcomes on the other end. So if we're saying that those, um, effects that we see on the surface are generated by structural processes that might actually be very different and that we don't know much about them. That's arguably where some of the evidence that we get from the more qualitative um, social sciences might come in handy. But our challenge is how we end up integrating those in practice, where we've got evidence about the causal mechanisms underneath, and we've got evidence at, at the top level about what happens, clinching, what happens when X leads to Y? How do we actually put those together in ways that are um, a bit more useful than simply writing up one set of papers that talks in detail theoretically about some of the mechanisms and another set of papers that says, here's our evidence about what happened when, this, when we, we did this intervention. So if I could just move on to the next slide, I want to just um, talk very briefly first about um, an example where we did try, I think, to put together some of the qualitative and some of the epidemiological evidence um, a bit more. And then I'll just say something about the kind of uh, challenges and, and what I think helped with that. And the example I'm gonna take, forgive me, those of you, uh, and I can see a few names in the participants who probably heard this. It's the one that was to hand, I'm gonna use it again. And it's, an evaluation of um, free bus travel for young people in London. So this was a scheme whereby um, anyone up to the age of 18 eventually was given, uh, a, a, if they wanted it, a free pass to travel on London's buses, not just in school times, but, but any time they want. And this was a scheme that was introduced with, with an explicit aim to help young people continue studying, improve employment prospects and promote the use of public transport. So it was part of a raft of measures that the mayor of London 
was using to try and reduce car travel by uh, promoting uh, public transport in London. And it also had this explicit aim of, of social inclusion. And we were funded to evaluate that by uh, NIHR. Um, if I could just move on to the next slide. But of course, the, um, <clears throat> the problem, well, not the problem, but the, the challenge, as so often with these complicated changes to whole systems, is that there are a whole raft of things that might happen as a result of that change that are of interest to different stakeholders. Um, and the, the, the debate around it at the time was, was quite vibrant. There, there, was, there were concerns about the impact on older bus users who also had free travel. There was concern about gang related violence. Um, other people were saying this is brilliant because kids in London don't have enough independence, it's good. Locally, um, public health practitioners were most concerned about obesity and the impact it was likely to have on physical activity. So there was this concern that if you get young people traveling on the bus, then they'll walk even less than they do already. And, and this is really not gonna help our obesity crisis. And in the light of a concern about uh, the kind of the economic rationality of the, of, of, the, uh, of the scheme, given that only some children were, uh, financial resources were a barrier, was it really right that all this public money was being spent on a scheme for everyone, whatever their income? So that was the kind of policy context. Um, and following on from kind of Nancy Cartwright's critique of trials and those kinds of evidence, we were suggesting that what decision makers need is evidence on the underlying principles by which the intervention works, as well as the key contextual factors that influence its effect. Otherwise, just data on whether it did or didn't improve, increase or decrease active travel or whether it did or it didn't increase or decrease social exclusion isn't really that helpful. So if, um, um, if I just move on to the next uh, slide, what we did was started off <clears throat> as one often does of, of putting together a fairly simplistic logic model of what we thought would happen if we gave everyone, a, uh, gave children a free bus bus pass, that that would increase the use of bus travel and that would have these other effects. Um, and we then kind of started thinking about what kind of data we might have that would shed light on the kind of evidence for each bit of that causal pathway and put together a way of thinking about, first of all, things that were already probably fairly well known, like if you do more active travel, do you get changes in physical and mental health outcomes? So you can possibly do a systematic review. Although rather worryingly, just as a spoiler alert, we, we found it really hard to find any evidence that more active interventions that increase active travel really do have any positive impact on, on um, health, at least for children. But, but that, that doesn't mean that they don't, it's just we certainly couldn't find any. Um, and then other things, there was reasonably good quantitative data from travel diaries or um, injury, uh, injury data and so on. So you could do a change on change analysis using adults as the counterfactual. So looking at the comparison of changes in children to adults who didn't have free travel um, to see if there was any kind of evidence that it was the scheme that had made that change at that top level. And then there were other things where there wasn't very good quantitative evidence. So the original plan had been just to use the, well, in part to use the qualitative data to sort of fill in at some fairly low level uh, to provide some evidence on um, some of the, um, some of the, um, uh, causal links that we didn't have any good quantitative evidence for. So if, if we just think about, I, I'm just gonna focus just for now on one particular set of outcomes, those around physical activity and the kind of economic um, rationality for the scheme being universal. And if I just turn first of all to some of that quantitative data, if I could just have the next slide, thank you. Um, and I'm not going to show loads of this, but but just to illustrate, um, some of the travel diary data suggested. The first the first little graph just shows, um, and we've got the the adults in red and the young people in orange. The first one suggests that oh dear, yeah, it looks like the scheme did reduce the number of walking trips a day, and not surprisingly, they were doing far more bus trips. There was a bit of a decrease in car trips. 
but it did look like they were doing far less walking. But um, if you also look at the distance they walk a day, um, there actually wasn't any difference compared with adults. There was, there was no, re no significant reduction at all in the distance walked. Um, not to get too excited, it still really wasn't very far. It's about just under a, a kilometre and a half a day on average um, that, that young people and children spend walking. But that's kind of, you know, what can you do with that just as quantitative data? So um, if I start by kind of just going, well, if, uh, the next slide, please. In terms, of, um, in terms of just a descriptive thematic analysis, which has, was what was originally intended, we could trawl through the data sets we had, and we had a very large amount of data from focus groups, interviews, and observations. And we could trawl through that and pull out quotes. And there are many, many quotes like this. I'll just take this because it's one of my favorite for, from a 14-year-old young man who said, my dad takes me, uh, he's talking about the journey to school. My dad takes me a couple of meters down the road in the car. It's only about 200 meters. And from there, I go and get the bus to school. And then it's only a few meters from when I get off the bus to go to school. I'm on the bus for roughly less than a minute. So we had lots and lots of data from children going, yep, yeah, hop on the bus for one stop or two stops. Um, and, and then I get off again just because it's there and just because I've got my bus, bus pass. So that looks like, if we're thinking about that, that um, um, we've just got some evidence that's in line with the, uh, the quantitative data that suggests that this bus travel is replacing walking. However, we then took a step back and took a rather more analytical approach to the data. And this is where I'm just gonna go back to Nancy Cartwright because I think her, um, her insights into the kinds of causal analysis that you can think about are quite useful here. If I just go on to the next slide. Um, Cartwright and Munro had this notion of thinking not about the effects of an intervention, but rather thinking about its capacities. What does the, the intervention have the capacity to do? So in this particular example, thinking about what free bus travel, what capacities does that have and how might they be important for public health? And thinking about the capacities, um, she suggests, uh, there are a number of components to that. First of all, it, it, the first thing to think about is the mode of operation. How, in this case, does bus travel operate to have the capacity to promote social inclusion or to reduce or increase active travel? She then suggests thinking about what she calls necessary auxiliaries. What else is needed for free bus travel to promote social inclusion or to not reduce active travel? And then destroyers, what can, can constrain that or hinder that capacity? And then what other capacities promote and retard that intervention? So again, thinking back to a bit of a system level and thinking about what else is going on in that system that might promote or hinder that capacity. And again, the rule of combination, thinking about the multiple things that are happening in a system that might come together for particular effects. So that proved a, a rather helpful way of going back, not just to the kind of thematic analysis of the data, but rather the analysis that the more inductive analyses that had been done up till then rather separately. If I can just go on to the next slide. Um, and I'm not going to show, and here I'm not going to show extracts from data because that's perhaps not the point. I'm just going to share with you some of the kind of outcomes of the analysis that was done very separately. So that generated a number of kind of uh, insights about what was going on. First, a key one was that a major driver of young people's travel mode choices was sociability. What trumped almost everything else in the data we had was that if there was an ability to travel together, that would be chosen above all else. So that meant that sometimes people would choose not to get in the car with their parents because it would mean that you couldn't go with travel with friends. It would mean if somebody didn't have a bus pass, you might not travel on the bus because they couldn't come with you. It would mean you might have a very long, complicated route to get to work so that you could call for several of your friends on the way at various bus stops. So that accounted for some of the reduction in car travel, at least at the margins. And it also accounted to some extent for that kind of disparity between the number of walking trips going down, but the distance walking not. 
because of course what would happen is you'd end up with far longer trips which would inevitably include some walking even if you were doing more of them with bus as your main um, mode of transport. Now, the second kind of implication of that, that the free bus plus pass can only do that. It can only provide a space for sociability and independent travel if everyone can do it. So it only works if everybody, if it's a universal intervention, if everybody has got a bus, bus pass that they can use. And the evidence from that comes partly from the kind of deviant cases. So um, you can lose your bus pass if you've been very badly behaved on the bus or if you've been borrowing your friends or something. So occasionally people would, would have it confiscated. And when we interviewed people who had had that experience of having a bus pass confiscated, they talked about the, the, the restrictions on their social activity, that it really did restrict them doing things. And their friends would say it was, it was a real pain because it meant you couldn't get out and about if somebody didn't have their bus pass. And the other deviant case was young people with disabilities, particularly those using wheelchairs, who said, actually, you can only get one wheelchair on a bus. They're not that accessible. Often you can't get the bus. So for them, the scheme made absolutely no difference at all. So that kind of suggested that a key bit of context is that it is a universal accessible bus system, that, that this is a, a, an important auxiliary of the, um, the capacity of the scheme to do things. It's also important to note um, that part of that analysis around the independence of travel was that the most important um, uh, factor was for discretionary travel. Most young people said it didn't really make much difference to school or employment opportunities because that's something parents would subsidise and would make sacrifices elsewhere to subsidise their school travel. But what they wouldn't do was pay for leisure travel. So it, it meant um, the social inclusion operated at that, at that range of social activity, not um, uh, in, access to employment and education, which were the things that we were focusing on originally and couldn't find any evidence for. And yet the qualitative evidence suggested it has a huge impact on social inclusion. Um, it's just that that wasn't being picked up in the thing that the scheme was originally designed to impact on, access to education and um, employment. And of course, the key thing is the past generates many additional trips. Um, so all that hopping on the bus for a stop or two also involves an awful lot of jumping on and off the bus, running between bus stops and within the bus. Um, it, it's not a passive experience like sitting in a car is. There was actually from the observation of work a fair amount of jumping around and running up and down, which might have negative effects on other people's public health. But if we're thinking about active travel, it was kind of incorrect to characterise the bus as a passive a passive mode. So if we just quickly flick on to the next slide, um, that, that suggested that the scheme has the capacities for increasing social exclusion without reducing active travel. We haven't got any evidence that it increases active travel, but we certainly have evidence that it hasn't reduced it. But we've also got some evidence about what promotes that. It has to be a universal scheme because it enables all to travel and it removes the stigma. It has to be free rather than reduced fares because it's that um, level of discretionary um, transport that, that, that the scheme really operates on. And it has to be within an accessible bus service. <clears throat> Absolutely doesn't work if you can't access the bus or there isn't a good bus system. So if I just move on um, to the next slide, that you can then start putting all of those bits of data together, the, the, the evidence from the quantitative um, findings on what difference it did make to active travel and what difference it did make to the other outcomes we were interested in, with the more quality things to have a much better um, understanding of what the intervention actually is and what the important elements of context are that, that mean that it can have these capacities. And that's what's useful for, for, for policymakers. So you can kind of say, we've got absolutely no evidence of what would work if you had a city with a far less comprehensive and efficient bus network. We can't say anything about what would happen if you just offered um, uh, concessionary fares that are lower than the adult fare. And we certainly haven't got any evidence about what would happen if you only did this for uh, low income young people. For this scheme to have these capacities, it had to be universal and it had to be free. 
So that's one example um, of how um, we can use this notion of capacities to help us integrate not the thematic analysis from qualitative data, but rather the more inductive findings from qualitative data. So if I just um, briefly move on, sorry, to the next slide, that's one way of doing it within one case study. I also just want to flag a, a rather more formal method for integrating qualitative and quantitative analysis that perhaps has not been broadly used in public health evaluation um, to date, but is one that I, I, I just kind of am thinking about whether there is a bit more potential in. And this is qualitative comparative analysis which um, is an approach that was originally designed um, in uh, comparative policy studies, macro sociology, for comparing <clears throat> cases, and cases were things like countries or regional <clears throat> um, regions, to look at things like uh, policy implementation or um, uh, the paths of welfare systems, this kind of thing. But there's been increasing interest in using it in public health because it uses set theory to look at configurations of conditions that might lead to particular outcomes or lack of outcomes. Now that's got um, potentially uh, quite an attractive promise for thinking about what's happening in complex systems and thinking about cause and inferences in complex systems. Because QCA makes three assumptions that I think are, are quite valuable for, for the sorts of things we're looking at. First of all, equifinality. It assumes that there's more than one causal pathway that might lead to a particular outcome. Secondly, it assumes what, what's called conjectural causation, where it's not the presence or absence of a particular condition that, that might lead to the outcome, but it's what the presence or absence of that condition in relation to other conditions might lead to. So it looks at those kind of configurations rather than separating them out. And thirdly, and this is something that I think gets under recognized a lot in public health is causal asymmetry. This idea that if, if you've got something that explains success, it doesn't necessarily imply that the lack of that thing leads to failure. Um, and just as a, a, a very brief example, um, we, when we looked at street lighting interventions, uh, um, sorry, the reduction of street lighting and the impact on public health, one thing that kept coming up was people said, oh, but there's all this evidence about you put in more street lighting and that improves safety. So surely if you take it away, it reduces safety. And actually that doesn't follow at all, that there are very, very different mechanisms going on about putting something in and taking it away. So the, the kind of explaining that causal, um, causal relationship does rely on, on assuming asymmetry. We, we can't just assume that the factors that explain success also explain failure in that way. So QCA has, um, has some promise. So we undertook a systematic review, uh, if I could just go on to the next slide, just to kind of look at how it had been um, used to date, um, just to see whether people had used this as a way of looking at things like, you know, were people looking at um, whether interventions were likely or not to be implemented in different settings, or whether they were more or less likely to be effective across cases and could you use that to understand these combinations of conditions um, and that should be found an increasing use and recent and it is all recent all of the examples we found were post 2005 um, of look of using QCA to look at public health evaluation questions um, typical uses were in trials for the process evaluation so people had used it to look at process evaluations Largely, the biggest single group of those studies were systematic reviews where it was being used in combination with typical regression analyses to look at what was a successful outcome and then using a QCA to try and figure out what the configurations of conditions might be that, 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 that predicted um, successful and less successful outcomes. But much less often, actually, for comparative implementation or the effects of policy interventions. So to some extent, it was a little bit surprising that the original use of QCA for these upstream policy level interventions had been far less used in, um, in public health evaluation. 
And if although there were a couple of um, uh, exceptions, uh, Blackman's um, research, for instance, that used QCA to look at the spearhead partnership areas in England and identify what the, the conditions were that might lead to successful narrowing of inequalities and what led to lack of narrowing of inequalities. And I think that, that set of studies was quite useful just in flagging up some rather surprising findings. One of the things across the studies that they did was that better contracting actually didn't lead to better outcomes in narrowing inequalities, rather counterintuitively, the more um, robust the contracting process was, the, the less likely that, that it was less likely to have these configurations that, that led to narrowing inequalities. So, um, right, I'd better wrap up. So if I just um, turn to some concluding remarks and reflections, I'm suggesting integrating diverse data sets is challenging because the analysis relies on different logics of causality. I'm suggesting, well, I think I'm suggesting one way through that is to be absolutely explicit about that, that we're, we're using different ways of putting data together, uh, putting um, evidence, um, evidence together to put those inferences in, and that we need to find ways of folding one way of doing that into another, rather than integrating at the level of data. So we're integrating at the level of analysis. And I flagged up two possible ways of doing that. One that was using Nancy Cartwright's idea um, of the capacities of interventions that enables us to think through the ways that different evidence the different parts and levels of causal relationships in a system might fit together. And a second way is using a formal method, qualitative comparison, comparative analysis, to compare configurations of conditions that lead to intervention implementation or outcomes across a series of cases. If I just move on to some reflections on that, um, I um, I just wanted to kind of think a bit about what, what kind of helps us do that in projects from my own experience and what hinders, a bit like a, a capacity. What helps is, is perhaps really um, rather um, obviously time. Um, and it's time at the end of a project when that analysis has been done, uh, as well as time throughout a project for meetings. And that works much better in longer term collaborations equal partnerships, and that's absolutely crucial for me because uh, speaking from the qualitative end of that, one needs absolute autonomy to do a proper qualitative analysis and not be constantly pushed back into some themes that reflect the deductive framework of the, of the trial bit or the, the kind of quasi experimental bit. You really do need to kind of work through the analysis first as I, I kind of illustrated, and then integrate that analysis, not the kind of thematic deductive bit. And the other thing that really helps, although again, it, it's probably fairly obvious, is logic models, not for formal uh, methodological reasons, but rather because they're brilliant boundary objects that actually do materialize some of the thinking you not only do within an academic team, but also more broadly with stakeholders, policymakers, local practitioners who, who can actually use that to think with and think through the kinds of inferences that, that, that you're drawing. What hinders, again, perhaps not surprisingly, the biggest problem is where on earth you put these syntheses. And I flagged up the one from On the Buses, which was published in a methodology journal in the end, not um, a policy journal. NIHR demand these galumphing great reports. What they don't want is a kind of brief policy synthesis, and perhaps they should. I think um, Chris Whitty in, a, in a, a paper a few years ago said that the kind of the most useful sorts of data for policy decisions were synthesis papers that pulled together different kinds of evidence. And those are perhaps what we're least good at writing, just for all the obvious reasons that in academia, we, we need the theoretical one in the in the, the high ranking journal or the methodological novelty. We nobody wants the kind of one that just puts all puts it all together. Uh, the other thing that hinders, and I've worked on a lot of projects where it's felt quite frustrating that we're forced again and again into a very deductive frame for the qualitative analysis, and I'm not sure that is the best way of integrating. And obviously, um, complex governance that I, I won't go into, the ways in which it's quite hard to write in 
um, a more iterative qualitative design into um, for ethics, for governance, for all of those reasons. If you want a more inductive design, it's much, much harder to read in. Um, and then finally, just a word from the sponsor. So the last slide, just the acknowledgements. Um, I, I, just to flag up that the On the Buses study was funded by NIHR, the QCA review by MRC. And I noticed somebody had um, a query in the thing on that, that study from Blackman, and I'll pop it in the chat in a minute, the, um, the, the reference for that. So thanks very much. Sorry, that was a very rapid rattle through, but the point of this was to kind of generate some discussion on how to better integrate rather than me tell it all. Thanks. Thanks very much, Judith.